Hello, and thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Dr. Augustine Choi, Dean of Wild Cornell Medicine, and I'm pleased to present the latest installment in our Wild Cornell Medicine Insights webinar series. As many of you know, insights bring you lively and interactive discussions with distinguished Wild Cornell faculty members who are experts in a range of important topics during these extraordinary times. Our goal with the series is to stay connected with you at a time when that is more important than ever, as well as to engage and inform. Today's webinar is The Perfect Score, COVID Testing and a Flattened Curve. We have a remarkable panel of experts for you, Dr. Nathaniel Hubert, Dr. Melissa Cushing, and Dr. Max Loda, Chair of the Department of Pathology. The discussion will be moderated by Dr. Renu Kashal, Chair of the Department of Population Health Sciences. Thank you very much again for joining us today. We appreciate your time, your support, and all you do for Wild Cornell Medicine. Now, I'll hand you over to your moderator, Dr. Kashal, to get things started. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Wild Cornell Medicine, I'm pleased to welcome you to the Perfect Score, st score COVID Testing and a Flattened Curve, the latest webinar in our, in our Wild Cornell Medicine Insight Series. I am Dr. Renu Kaushal, Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Research, Chair of the Department of Population Health Sciences, and the Nanette Laitman Distinguished Professor of Healthcare Policy and Research. We are joined today by Dr. Melissa Cushing, Director of Clinical Laboratories and Vice Chair of the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, as well as Professor of Anesthesiology. We will also hopefully shortly be joined by Dr. Nathaniel Hubert. He's having momentary technical issues. Nathaniel is the co-director of the Cornell Institute for Disease and Disaster Preparedness at Wall Cornell Medicine and Associate Professor of Population Health Sciences as well as of medicine. Finally, we are thrilled to have with us today Dr. Massimo Loda, also known as Max. Max is a chair of the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, the David T. Thompson Professor of Pathology and Deputy Director of the Meyer Cancer Center. Before we get started, I want to take a brief moment to extend a special welcome to our partners and medicine members, many of whom have joined us today as attendees. We want to thank you for your ongoing support and dedication to Wall Cornell Medicine, especially over these last few months. You have provided support for all parts of our mission to care, to discover, and to teach, but perhaps most critically, to help our frontline care workers during this challenging time. It's now been seven months since the COVID-19 pandemic hit New York. And here at Wall Cornell Medicine, we've had great success on many fronts. We built a comprehensive testing program in the midst of an escalating pandemic. We made numerous clinical advances and led breakthrough research that has improved patient outcomes, our own patients, as well as patients across the world. And we used mathematical modeling to help city, state, and national leaders make decisions that affected the trajectory of this pandemic. Still, COVID continues to spread. Even as we deploy various efforts to control this virus, efforts that include isolation, quarantining, social distancing, masking, and very aggressive testing as well as contract, contact tracing. As you will hear, these are all effective methods at reducing transmission, especially on a one-to-one -one basis. But part of the reason COVID has been such a challenge to control is due to the way in which it is transmitted. As many of us know, it is primarily spread through airborne transmission. And that transmission is even more likely when numerous individuals are close together for an extended duration in an enclosed space. Unlike more familiar viruses like influenza, SARS-CoV-2 also appears to achieve much of its spread 
by means of large clusters, meaning that this novel virus is what epidemiologists call an overdispersed pathogen. This means that one contagious person in the right setting may endanger many others. For example, the infamous choir practice in Washington state, wherein 87% of the involved singers became infected. These so-called super spreading events have marked the global advance of COVID-19. This characteristic of SARS-CoV-2 poses special challenges as we will hear from our panelists. So today we will start by talking about the various COVID testing methods and examine which ones are most effective for which setting. Then we'll take a look at how factors like clusters and super spreading events could impact the course of this virus and what current pandemic models are predicting for the upcoming year. And throughout, we will consider what we're doing right here at Wall Cornell Medicine to flatten the curve and to keep the infection rates as low as possible. We will begin today's webinar with a panel discussion for about 40 minutes. We will then open the floor to you for your questions. So please write them down and be prepared to submit them to us via the chat feature, which we'll turn on when it's time for Q&A. And with that, let me turn it to our panelists. Um, I, I, I don't believe we um, have Nathaniel on yet. And so I will start with some questions for, for Max and Melissa. Um, and Max, um, I think the first question is really for you. It was remarkable in the early days of this pandemic to watch you and your team set up testing here at Mal Cornell Medicine. Can you talk about the expanded testing that you have implemented with your team and how it has made an impact on our ability to treat patients who come to our medical center? Thank you for, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And um, I'm glad to uh, commence a conversation uh, about this. In, uh, as we all know, in late Febr February, beginning of uh, March, we started to see the first patients in, in New York State and in Manhattan uh, with, uh, uh, with the suspected SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. Uh, we, uh, and when I say we, I say people in my department, and I talk about Melissa Cushing, and I talk about Lars Westblade, and many others, uh, uh, Hannah Renner, that uh, put uh, a group uh, together and thought uh, how to act quickly to uh, 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 to address the to address the issue in record time. Uh, we set up uh, molecular testing for this virus uh, in uh, difficult circumstances. We didn't have uh, uh, the actual virus to test it against. Uh, we had to uh, recuperate uh, uh, other coronavirus to make sure that these were not uh, interfering with the test and the test was uh, specific and significant. And when uh, the uh, uh, emergency order came out so that we could uh, actually uh, put together a clinically um, uh, validated test. This was done in absolutely record time in about uh, 10 days. So we were ready uh, online on March 7th when the infectivity rate was about two to three percent and jumped to an astounding 60 percent uh, a month later. Uh, over the course of time, we set up uh, uh, additional tests uh, to increase capacity and to diversify because of the lack of, of reagents uh, onto uh, several platforms. We were aided by uh, Wild Cornell uh, Medicine, by uh, New York Presbyterian, by everybody that came together, uh, technicians, faculty, uh, uh, molecular biologists, pathologists, etc., to put together a team that worked 24-7 to set up uh, high throughput tests that went up in the thousands per day in a matter of just a few weeks. Uh, I think that helped uh, uh, 
tremendously our clinical colleagues which, who were starting to see patients in the ED, in the emergency, in, in emergency department uh, coming in at an incredible uh, rate. So I commend the people who did this and I think that put us in a in the uh, in a right uh, place to be leaders uh, at uh, Wild Cornell here uh, uh, and work together with uh, Columbia University as well uh, and New York Presbyterian. So that's in a nutshell is what happened at the beginning. There's much more to that uh, ser serum testing, etc. And maybe Melissa can comment further, but uh, I think it was uh, it was an incredible effort at the beginning. Yes, no, and, and thank you, Max. It, it was not trivial, and the way in which you all accomplished it was really, truly remarkable. So, so thank you. Melissa, let me turn it to you. Can you talk a little bit about the types of diagnostic tests currently available and what we're using right here at Wall Cornell Medicine, including things like the RT-PCR test, antigen testing, pool testing, antibody testing, and in particular with antibody testing, what do those results mean in terms of potential, potential protection from a COVID recurrence? Sure, absolutely. Um, and thanks again for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here um, today talking about the experience we had over the last six months. Um, so let me start with um, describing um, the two basic types of tests that you'll hear about. There are the diagnostic tests, which tell you, are, am I infected currently or am I not? And then there are the antibody tests, which tell you, have I been exposed to the virus? So within the diagnostic tests, there's really two broad categories. Um, there are the um, nucleic acid tests that you've heard about, PCR tests or another name for that. Um, those tests are basically measuring the virus's genetic material. And those tests, the nucleic acid tests, PCR tests, sometimes you also hear it called RT-PCR, um, they're all very um, similar because they measure the genetic material um, of the virus. And they're very sensitive and they're very specific, meaning that you can have very, very low levels of virus in a patient and still pick it up. And it's very unlikely to, that if you get a positive for those tests that you're um, making a mistake and it's a false positive because you, it's cross-reactive with another similar virus. They're, they're very specific to the um, agent of COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so in the beginning of the pandemic, none of these tests existed, of course, because this, this organism was new to um, all of mankind. So um, that's a lot of you know, what Max just talked about because it was really a scramble in the beginning to figure out, you know, build a test from scratch, a, a process that usually takes multiple years. Um, we were all trying to do it in, in a few weeks. Um, so the, the RT-PCR test or the um, nucleic acid tests are considered the gold standard because of their high level of sensitivity and their specificity. But there's also another test called um, the antigen test, which is also used to diagnose the infection. And um, the antigen tests are different because they're actually measuring a protein on the virus. And depending on which assay you look at, it'll um, the proteins tend to, to differ, but um, some of the most common ones are the spike protein um, of, of SARS-CoV-2. So the, um, the, the antigen tests have been approved more recently versus RT-PCR, and they tend to have a specific role in screening patients. So if you're a patient that comes in who's symptomatic or you've just been exposed to someone who has COVID-19, you would really want to get the most sensitive test possible, which is the PCR test. However, if you're trying to screen a workplace, um, a nursing home, a school, a congregate setting, you might want to consider using an antigen test. They are um, quite a bit less sensitive. So the chances of um, missing an, an infection when a patient actually is infected, um, which is called um, a um, false negative, is higher with the antigen test. However, the benefits to the antigen tests are that they are very fast. Some of them are, you can get a result within 15 minutes. They're generally very inexpensive, um, a couple dollars to run versus you know, thirty to fifty dollars to run, and then um, in rate uh, in the chemicals, um, and that's the cost of the, the chemicals that it um, or the, we call them reagents that it takes to run the tests. And then the other main benefit is that they can be run on very simple instruments um, that are not very expensive and that are not very hard to to um, use. 
One of the difficulties with the RT-PCR test is that it requires very experienced personnel um, to understand how to run those tests, very complicated equipment, and it can be quite time consuming. So um, within the um, uh, RT-PCR setting, because that is the, the gold standard for diagnosis, um, Renu had mentioned the term pooled testing. So one of the methods that we're currently using in, a, in our hospital and a lot of hospitals around the country now is uh, pooled testing. And the reason um, that we're using pooled testing is that there are national shortages of almost every single reagent that's available um, for high throughput testing in a hospital laboratory. And the benefit for pooling is that you can take multiple samples from multiple patients put them all together in one tube and run that tube on our instruments and get a result. Right now in New York City, um, levels of positivity for COVID-19 are very low. So we're around potentially one to 3%. So most of those pools are gonna be negative. If the pool is negative, we could assume that every single person within that pool is also negative and send a negative response to them. However, if we find a positive in a pool, then we have to do something called deconvolution, which basically means if you have um, five people in a pool, you'd go back to the original sample that was drawn and you would run each of those individually um, and then figure out which ones or one or more were positive within that pool. And that has been extremely useful um, for hospitals all over the country, including ours, because basically it drastically reduces the amount of chemicals or reagents that we need um, and really helps us deal with some um, shortages. So to finish off your question, Renu, the last test I want to talk about is the antibody test. And um, antibody tests have gotten a lot of press and sometimes bad press because um, they, depending on which test and some of the tests that were approved earlier on or approved in other countries, um, had a lot of false positives. Um, as well as false negatives. So people who um, had the infection were not being detected and patients who didn't have the infection were getting an incorrect positive result, which is a, a very big problem. So just to step back, the antibody test really looks at whether a patient has an immune response to this um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. So that just basically is what it is at that point. And, and, and at, per our understanding, as of October 2020, we know that that means that an antibody is present. What we don't know at this point is whether that prevents someone from being reinfected. Um, so the antibodies tend to be present for a few months and then start to decline. Um, and we also don't know how long it's really going to take um, for the antibodies to go away because we're still only six months into this. Um, but for the antibody tests, they are most useful to tell you whether you've been exposed. So if you, you know, thought somebody, a family member or um, a coworker had the um, test, you got a very mild cold or sore throat, and then you wanted to go back and, you know, figure out, did I, was I exposed to it? That test will give you the answer to that. It won't give you the answer about whether you could be reinfected or not. Um, and those tests are most accurate two to three weeks after the exposure because your immune system takes time to make the antibodies the immune response. Um, so if you have that test too early, then you may have um, a negative result, whereas um, your body just hasn't had the time to make the antibody yet. Um, so that's um, the, the three main types of tests that we're using currently in a nutshell. So, so let me see if I can summarize what I just heard. The, the gold standard for detection is the PCR test, but we are hitting a point where the reagents have uh, become more and more limited. That's correct. Um, the antigen test is a rapid test. Uh, and then after someone is presumably infected, what we would like to do is an antibody test to understand whether or not they have been exposed and mounted in the immune response. Um, Max, let me ask you a, a question about the, the rapid antigen test. When might you use that test and what are the indications for it? So uh, I'd like to step back for, for a minute and also point out that there is a as Melissa pointed out in the antibody test, there is a lag period between exposure and the uh, rise of the antibodies in the in the plasma. So there's 
uh, the timing of the of testing needs to be considered and that's true also for rt pcr from exposure to actual detection uh, uh it could take uh, a little bit of time so that's that's important to to know uh, i think antigen testing as melissa allu uh, uh, alluded to uh, would be useful to uh, detect uh, uh, clusters of, of patients uh, that have been exposed. Uh, uh, it would be useful as a screening test in a sense because it's rapid and it's cheap, uh, uh, but then needs to be followed up with a more uh, validated test that tells you that either that you have been infected, i.e. the PCR test, or molecular test or RT-PCR test, or that you have been exposed to the virus, i.e. the serologic test, the antibody test that, uh, that Melissa just talked about. So I, I, I think that uh, it's important for, for, for the layperson to know what a test is, what a rapid test is as well. Uh, and if I may add uh, uh, this, um, uh, this concept is a rapid test is something that we can report back in sometimes 15 minutes, sometimes uh, an hour, sometimes two hours. But one has to take into account also the instrument that does that test. Is it a one at a time test that you can do in a, in a doctor's office? Or is it a test that you, where you can put together 100, 200, 300 specimens, because that has implications as to who to test. If you have three or four patients coming into your office and you want a rapid test one at a time, you could use certain instruments. If you, if you, would, if you would like to test populations, uh, sets of patients, uh, clusters, if you will, you use a different instrument. So there's a lot of subtleties that, that actually play into the, the uh, uh, interpretation uh, of, uh, of a test and, and when to use them, I would say. And, yeah, um, if I could just add one more thing here. I think a lot of people in the, um, you know, in the press, you read about rapid tests. And within the category of rapid tests, there are two, the antigen test that I described, and then there's also a rapid type um, test for the RT-PCR. And in terms of their, um, ability to detect low levels of infection, an antigen test is not that great at it. But the um, RT-PCR rapid test is actually very, very sensitive and able to pick up very small amounts. So in the press, I think sometimes they just say rapid test, but it's important to ask, you know, is it which type of rapid, um, rapid test is it? Is it a RT-PCR rapid or is it an antigen? Because that really kind of tells you about how accurate that test is. Terrific. Um, Melissa, you just mentioned that pool testing is something that we can do when the rate in a community is relatively low. At what cutoff is pool testing no longer a viable option? Mm, that's a great question. So, um, I, you know, from logic would tell us that once we start getting to pools that are, you know, 5, 10, 15 percent, it doesn't really help us at all if we have to deconvolute them each time and, and run them. The FDA also has rules about it, and they um, have uh, set a, sta a threshold of 5%. So once um, an area is above 5% in terms of the percent that are positive of all people tested, then we generally stop doing um, the pool testing. One, because we're just worried about accuracy, but also two, because it just doesn't make sense. We're really doing it to, to save the extra reagents, um, and if we are deconvoluting every single one of them, then we wind up actually using more reagents than we need to. Yeah. Max, what what do you think are the most important advances that we need to make as it surrounds testing? Well, if you going forward, I think that uh, we need to be uh, more and more rapid, and I think we're getting there. More and more high throughput. Uh, and uh, I think we need point of care, possibly, so that you don't uh, uh, you don't have to have uh, the personnel, the machinery, and the know-how uh, that we need to have in an FDA-approved test in in a hospital. 
if you could ideally do point of care uh, testing that is rapid and reliable, uh, that's something that people are working on, including here at Wild Cornell. Uh, there's a, there are a lot of investigators that uh, have set up uh, very um, uh, uh, clever tests in, in, in a way we, where you need uh, uh, limited uh, in instrumentation and uh, would uh, yield high specificity and sensitivity. We're hoping to come up with tests uh, of that sort. The other, I think, is uh, given the, um, the uh, uh, decreasing costs of sequencing uh, and the possibility that uh, even though this virus, this virus gets mutations not that uh, frequently, it is to uh, assess strains, to assess uh, maybe nosocomial strains or, or strains that occur in the hospitals or strains that occur in the populations and how they differ from one another. And I would venture to say possibly even how people respond to different strains. We know very little about that right now. I think sequencing or sequencing of particular regions of the virus that are uh, particularly important for the infections uh, and for the for the uh, aggressivity of, of, of the virus might benefit from knowing more from the molecular biology of the virus, how this virus changes over time and, and then uh, results in, in, in a change how the infection goes forward. So looking forward, I think that those are the areas that I would uh, uh, focus my attention on, but maybe Melissa has uh, additional ideas. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all those, and those are all things that we are um, trying to work on here as well. Um, I, I think one of the places in, so at Wild Cornell, we're, we're fabulous at doing the diagnostic testing on symptomatic patients, patients coming in for surgery, hospitalized patients, and that's our, our job. I think um, as a society overall, we're not doing as well with the um, mass screening in congregate settings. So I think um, one of the areas that we could really improve is the um, those rapid tests that can be run very quickly and easily so that people can you know, take a, te a test almost every day if they're going to be going to a workplace or if they're going to be going to a school or if they're in a nursing home. Um, and I think that's somewhere, um, and I know the NIH has a whole initiative to, to work on this. And this is also, as Max said, something that we're looking at here at Well Cornell as well. But um, I think that is current uh, a limitation currently with society that we all need to be working on. And, and I think we all are. It's just taking a little bit longer because this, um, this virus is so new. But um, those are basic places. I think Max also alluded to the fact that we're looking at the virus itself and whether it's fading over time. Um, and we're comparing our results that we saw back in um, uh, March and April versus what we're seeing for positives now and looking to see has the um, the genetic material of the virus drifted to see if we can predict whether, you know, people are less likely to be, have severe infections now versus then, or and is there anything in the genetic material that can help us understand whether a patient is going to be ha have a, a severe infection or, or are they going to be spreading the infection more? Um, so those are all things that we are um, currently interested in, in looking at. And then I, I appreciate that. My, my understanding is that um, this virus is, is relatively stable, as, as Max just mentioned. Um, is, does there seem to be more than one strain across the world, or does it really seem like we are primarily dealing with one strain of this virus? So there are, uh, if you're asking me, there are websites that uh, follow the strains of this virus. There seem to be different strains that then spread to different populations uh, or, or to different segments of, of the population within a country or to different countries. So you can actually follow them in, in, a, in, in some sort of, a, 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 you know, following the mutations of the virus or alterations in the DNA code, the RNA code, you can actually follow how these spread uh, uh, over time. Uh, uh, having said that, uh, uh, you're right, that it's a virus that doesn't change the genetic code very frequently, uh, but 
you know, the virus uh, either wants to become more aggressive and more infectious or wants to survive more. So maybe some of these mutations uh, make it such that it's not as uh, aggressive as it was maybe at the beginning, but maybe spreads more uh, and, and, and survives better. So I, I think that we, we need to discern between one or, 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 or the other uh, option that the virus uh, uh, might use. And then there's the whole issue of vaccines uh, that comes into play, but that's, that's another story. <laughs> I'll get there in just one moment. Uh, I, I, uh, Melissa, this, this is a question for you. Um, and then I, I do want to pivot to, to vaccines before we open this up to Q&A. We, of course, at Wall Cornell would never talk about anyone in our care and certainly not anyone who is in not in our care. <laughs> However, events on the national front over the past week have raised some questions around how it is determined that someone is no longer infective. Could you describe to us the current gold standard for testing to determine whether or not a person is still infectious? Sure. I mean, um, I actually think that they're probably, testing probably may not be the, the gold standard there, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So um, some of our tests are extremely sensitive, the RT-PCR specifically. So we know that we can detect um, small bits of genetic material for much longer than a patient winds up being infectious. So sometimes when studies have been done, patients who have long recovered, maybe 40 or 42 days or more after the onset of their symptoms, we can still pick up some genetic material. Now, if you take that genetic material and you put it into an animal to see if it grows in a, in a lab, it wouldn't grow at that point, so it's not infectious. So we prefer not to do too many of those types of tests later on because some people, it seems, don't clear the virus as quickly as others, but they're not infectious. So, um, of course, the antigen test um, in that setting will have the, the same type of flaws um, and potentially even more because it um, is even, um, it's, it's less sensitive. So if you're using that, you know, and, and you wanted to say, okay, five days after infection, there's a chance that you might falsely think that you're not infectious anymore, but it's just because that test is less sensitive. So that's not a good option either. So basically the, the CDC has specific recommendations there and um, they say that you should, um, people who have had mild to moderate illness um, should wait at least 10 days after the beginning when their symptoms first appeared and at least 24 hours after their last fever without the use of medication um, and their symptoms have improved. So that's generally how we recommend um, like following that. The, the tests have flaws in, when looking at um, uh, when people are negative. And sorry to interrupt. Uh, you know a lot about longitudinal studies and you know, following people over time is something that's going to teach us a, a whole lot. Uh, you know, both negative and positive. That's another area to to potentially discuss. Max, could you comment on our testing capabilities in in the U.S. and the type of tests that we're relying on versus uh, the 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 distribution of different types of tests across the world? Um, uh, is it the same distribution of RT-PCR and, and uh, the rapid antibody tests, or is the distribution different as you look across the world? The distribution of, uh, I missed the, the testing, the distribution of the testing. So I, I, I think that there, uh, I, I guess there are different subtypes of RT-PCR using different reagents and, 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 and uh, uh, probes to to do this, but in general, I think that the results of the molecular tests are comparable, are largely comparable uh, across the world. The results of the serologic tests are very, in my view, are very different and 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 difficult to to interpret. So that w what uh, what Melissa did, um, didn't mention earlier is that as she developed she and her team developed the, the antibody test. She worked very closely with uh, basic researchers who had uh, who had viral particles that were growing and they were testing for so-called neutralizing antibodies. Mm -hmm. or those that actually 
are, are supposed to kill the, uh, the virus, and there was a lot of correlation there between the two. Not all antibody tests have that type of uh, correlation with uh, uh, true bona fide uh, uh, viral, uh, uh, live virus tests uh, in, in vitro. So I think I would trust uh, comparisons of uh, molecular tests, uh, RNA-based tests uh, across the world by, by, and, by and large, but I would not be as trustworthy of, uh, of comparing a serologic test, but I'm, I will hear what Melissa has to say about this. And um, yeah, and I, I think across the world, there are different um, countries are kind of putting their eggs in different baskets. So um, I think some places are using antigen tests more and um, certain um, of the nucleic acid tests, and there's there's RT-PCR, but then there's also other subtypes of, of nucleic acid tests that are still being developed. There's things that you're reading about in the paper, CRISPR, um, LAMP, all those um, things. So and I, I think different parts of the world have kind of um, used the different opportunities that they have there and the expertise of scientists in, in different areas. But I think the overall um, approach has, has been similar in terms of testing. Wonderful. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and open this up for Q and A. Um, our our first question is: What tests can be used upon arrival in New York to avoid a fourteen day quarantine, if any? <laughs> don't don't jump. <laughs> well, I, I I would say you know. Uh, Nasopharyngeal swab, molecular test is uh, is the first test to do. Uh, I'm not sure that that avoids the quarantine. Yeah. Because yeah, of the time lag that there is between exposure or perceived exposure or unknown exposure, and when when you arrive, I mean, I've I've had patients that wanted to come here from other areas of uh, of the country to be seen. And the issue was then would I have to quarantine for two weeks uh, because I've been on a plane, for example. And then that perceived exposure would delay the positivity of the test. So it's a difficult question to answer, to, to be honest. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess if you were on the plane and you had just been exposed during that flight and then, you know, your body needs time to incubate before we can pick it up with our, our tests. So it, um, it's actually easier to figure out a time period when you're already symptomatic because by then you, you really should be picked up by your tests if you're having the sore throat, the uh, lack of smell, those things. The, by that point, our tests are so sensitive that they should absolutely pick it up. But depending on when your exposure was um, really depends on when our tests should pick it up. But as Max said, the most sensitive is the RT-PCR. Mm -hmm. Max, this is a question for you. Once we have a vaccine, will testing still be a critical tool in controlling infection rates? Uh, the short answer, I think, is yes, because uh, first of all, the uh, how effective the vaccine will be, it's, it's to be seen. It, it, it would take a while to uh, to figure out the, uh, how effective a vaccine is, it would. Uh, it also depends on the uh, amount of uh, population immunity or herd immunity that can be achieved with a vaccine, if effective, uh, and that needs to be high enough to to for the vaccine to be effective. That, in turn, in my view, requires continued testing. Uh, uh, the, the third uh, portion of it is we, we, that we haven't talked about is, uh, is the host response. Will everybody respond to a vaccine or there will be a subpopulation that does not respond to, to, to a vaccine? And uh, testing would help us uh, determine that. And by testing, I mean both molecular testing and serologic testing. I think the vaccine question is is a... Uh, it's a long-term question, and maybe Melissa and Nathaniel can comment on this as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I would say that probably we're going to be doing a lot of antibody testing once the vaccine comes out, and hopefully we'll be able to correlate um, uh, response, and, and meaning that you're immune to future infections with the antibodies by then. Um, but I think um, before, you know, we're going to have many candidate vaccines, we may have multiple approved. And so I think, um, you know, people will want to know, is the vaccine working? So I, I think antibody testing will become front and center once we um, get in that world. The next question is about reagents. What is What are the barriers to having enough reagents? And a, a corollary of that question is that young adults, particularly in the college setting, are getting tested more frequently. Is that a wise use of reagents or should those reagents be saved for uh, potentially sick patients? It's a great question um, and it's one that I struggled with on a daily basis in, in the laboratory. Um, so I would say the re reagents that are um, the most in shortage are the ones that were approved um, by the FDA through the EUA approval process. Um, and they are the ones that are run on our huge high throughput analyzers. Um, and they're the ones that we have, as I mentioned, we have the rapid tests and then we have the slower tests. And the rapid tests can you know, be within an hour or two, even though they're RT-PCR. And those reagents are just not available. I mean, they're just uh, basically what the, com the companies have done is put, put the reagents on allocation. So they've looked at their whole client um, group across the country and said, okay, your center gets this many per day, your center gets this. And because everybody really wants that test or those those type of tests, um, they go very quickly and they're, they're hard to come by. Um, what some of the universities are doing is um, a little bit different. And they are, you know, they're not in the business of treating sick patients that we need to have a, de a definite diagnosis. They're kind of doing more of a um, screening of the population. And so they're, a lot of them are building their own um, testing labs and using reagents that aren't the big manufacturers, high throughput ones that we're using in the um, hospitals. So that gives them a lot more leverage to use reagents that aren't as in greater So, you know, as me, and from my perspective as the laboratory director, I don't consider that like competition with me getting um, reagents to, to test our patients. Um, but it's a good, it's a, it's a great question because um, you would think by this, by six months that we would have a lot more of the reagents that we need in the, in the hospital labs to run high throughput analyzers. But there have been a number of reasons that, um, that there's been delays. For instance, now we're in flu season. So a lot of the companies are coming up with assays that measure both flu and SARS-CoV-2 in the same. So they have to, you know, every time they change their agent, they have to do all kinds of quality control and, and it takes a long time for their factories to really scale up to, to be able to provide that for us. Understood. That's right. I, I would add that we have, uh, are bound by strict rules of how we deliver these, these tests, as opposed to the screening in schools or, or in colleges that, uh, that can perform these tests and, and their, uh, conditions that are more lax and can, re, as Melissa said, use reagents that are, that are different. We, we need to use specific reagents. And if we change, you know, one comma of, of, the, of, of the formula, we have to validate the whole thing again. Understood. Understood. Um, I, I like this next question. What is, when is the optimal time to get tested for an asymptomatic person who has recently been on a flight and which test should he or she get? Um, it, it's similar to the first question. So, um, yeah, I would say that um, if, it, you know, whatever the onset of your exposure, potential exposure would be, um, you would want to do it at least probably three to five days afterwards, um, assuming you're still asymptomatic. Of course, if you're symptomatic, then you can get, you know, tested right away. Um, if you if you want the most sensitive test, um, possible, then you'd want to go um, get an RT-PCR test. Um, there may be also a role for that type of situation for testing, using antigen tests, but doing it more frequently. Maybe you want to get an antigen test every day, and eventually, if you were positive, it would pick, you know, you the infection would be picked up when you got to a highest level. But I don't think there is any perfect answer to that. But I think um, you, you do have to give your body a little time to make enough virus to be detectable. Mm -hmm. There's a question about testing for children in schools. And uh, it, it seems to me that this is more a question of K through 12 schools. Um, 
I I might comment on on this question. Um, so the 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 question in specific is, can you use testing of children in schools to flatten the curve in communities that are currently experiencing a surge in positivity rates? The whole the the issues surrounding children in communities and school reopening is. I think very fraught and very dependent on local circumstances. And so it, it's generally thought that if a community's rate of infectivity, meaning the percent of patients tested who are actually positive, is over 5%, that schools should consider um, closing and going remote. If it's over 9%, those considerations are even stronger. Um, and uh, the the use of, of testing, Nathaniel's just walked into my office. Come on in, Nathaniel. I'm going to slip on a mask. Um, the use of testing of children in schools is, is, is it's, it's complex. I think that it's a combination of um, uh, ensuring that safe practices and policies are employed, ensuring that um, uh, there's appropriate ventilation and filtration in a given school, ensuring that children and staff members are doing self-attestation reports each day. And then finally, utilize testing as appropriate to um, uh, contain potential outbreaks. A number of schools across New York City are doing pool testing, which Melissa explained to us just a few minutes ago. I'm going to pause. I'm going to stand up and give Nathaniel my my seat. Um, Nathaniel, I'm I'm just going to give you uh, you know the next three minutes or so to talk about your the main points that you were hoping to convey today, and it's terrific to have you here. Thank so you very welcome. much. Thanks, Renew. And I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, I I just experienced uh, multi-device failure, including a new, brand new iPhone. So that was unexpected. Um, but you know, the world throws you curveballs all the time. Uh, this ha I just came back from ITS, so they've got my laptop. Um, so uh, based on what I know about what the discussion most likely has um, uh, covered, uh, you know, the, the big question now is, can contact tracing really turn the tide here? And in addition, can it turn the tide in other locations? Uh, are we able to withstand the really forceful spread of this pandemic across the United States uh, and, and manipulate enough of the individual outbreaks so that we can get a handle on uh, uh, so essentially get ahead of the curve. I think the best example of that is what's happening right here in New York State. Um, you know, we have, uh, we're in the top 10, I would say, of all states in terms of um, the capacity to test and the turnaround for tests. So we've, uh, one ranking has New York State at about a 220% of the recommended test amount that contrasts with many of the Midwestern and Northern Midwestern states that are currently experiencing terrible outbreaks where their comparable percentage is in the low teens or mid teens. Some of those states have 23% positivity rate. New York is now dealing with, as I'm sure you know, several clusters and they are dealing with these extremely intently. Um, I have, uh, actually a lot of faith that we will be able to get a handle on those clusters and they will not translate, they will not turn into widespread uh, community-based outbreaks. That is because we've been doing it for many months and, and we have the capability and the personnel and the systems to do this type of response. One of the things that's often not discussed when we hear about the, the testing, the machinery for the testing, the science for the testing, which are critical, without that we couldn't do any of this, it's the next step. What do we do with the information? And so many of us are focused on the response trajectory 
once we get the positive test, how do we turn that around into action? That's where we have involved our engineers. For example, the group up in Ithaca who've created and executed an incredibly successful uh, series of, of test and trace and pooled testing interventions that have kept Cornell, along with a couple of other places, you probably read about Duke in the New York Times, at an incredibly low level of positivity, uh, despite the fact that overall in the country, there have been a number of large scale outbreaks. So I think we have an example here in New York where we can show that given the proper investment in time, effort and technology and also information ecosystems, we can actually get a handle on this. I'm not sure that's possible in other parts of the country right now. I'm going to give this chair back to, know, to Renu. No, you're going to sit right, oh, right sit. there, please. Um, uh, I know that there were several questions for you. I think that the, one of the large questions of Daniel is, do you think that herd immunity mm. will ever develop to such an extent that it will uh, uh, essentially eliminate our need to more actively respond to this virus? It's an excellent question. In fact, I've just been talking with a number of colleagues at Oxford, some of whom signed the what you may know as the Great Barrington uh, Decree, which essentially argued for um, a sort of laissez-faire approach to all but the most vulnerable in the population, about 20% of the population, very contentious. Um, the World Health Organization just two days ago came out saying that we should not aim for herd immunity. This is, uh, as I'm sure you know, what Sweden's chief epidemiologist and, and health authorities decided to go for early on in the pandemic. I think the jury is still out about the Swedish experiment. You know, uh, talking to, to Swedes, they would say, well, we weren't really laissez-faire. We were quite adherent to the site, the types of things that, that you were doing here in the United States. We just didn't have decrees about them. Um, whether or not you believe that, the numbers show that Sweden did have a much higher earlier uh, per capita mortality, probably because they forgot to effectively shield their nursing homes. But the U.S. has now passed that Swedish uh, mortality per capita curve. And Sweden is fairly stable at this point. Whether that's because of what they did or simply happenstance is really not yet known. I think the next month will show whether this, what, what we could call the Swedish approach actually works. There are many scientists working on trying to figure out whether the 60% number that individuals like Tony Fauci have put out there as, a, as an upper limit for what you need to um, sorry, a lower limit for what you need to achieve for herd immunity to take effect. Other groups, respectable mathematical epidemiologists have bumped that number down, first to the mid 40s and now to the 20s. And as I'm sure you know, in New York City, antibody positivity ranges from about 19% in Manhattan up to the low 30s in Queens and the Bronx based on the most recent data that the New York City Department of Health has put out. So there's a question, are we there already? Is, is it true that because of individual differences in susceptibility to this virus, we shouldn't all be treated like uh, marbles in a barrel, the way classic old fashioned mathematical epidemiology used to treat people. We actually have to pay attention to the complexity of how individuals interact and individual susceptibility based on lifestyle, et cetera. We are learning interesting lessons. For example, our colleagues in Haiti with whom we've been working continuously throughout this, uh, this epidemic, uh, Haiti has now achieved a kind of remarkable uh, decline in their caseload with about one tenth of the mortality that even revised models predicted. How is that possible? How has South Africa gotten through their outbreak seemingly with such a lower per capita mortality rate than other places in, uh, certainly in the OECD countries, but, but even other places in um, you know, uh, the, the Western hemisphere? So there's lots that we don't know. I think the answer to Raina's question is, 
it is possible that there is a herd immunity threshold out there that is different than what standard mathematical epidemiological models said it was at the beginning of this outbreak. And we are rapidly going to find out whether that's the case because we certainly won't have widespread use of a vaccine before many of these models, including ours, I should say, suggest that there will be a tail off, even with no masks, no social distancing, no nothing. This virus may in fact run out of steam sooner than people think. The problem is we can't tell when and we can't tell where. So as, as the, the movie saying goes, that's not a lot to go on. In fact, that's almost nothing to go on, but we're trying. That's a line from Harry Potter, by the way. <laughs> Um, thank you, Nathaniel, and thank you to Max and Melissa and to all of you for joining us today for th today's important and thought-provoking discussion. I apologize on behalf of, of, um, of uh, Nathaniel and the technical issues that, that, that he had. I think this, it would have been wonderful to hear a little bit more from you, Nathaniel. Um, thank you for attending. Thank you for your insightful questions and joining us for this webinar in our series, Wall Cornell Medicine Insights. Now I'd like to turn things back over to Dean Choi for a closing message. Thank you, Renu, Max, and all of our panelists. I'm very grateful for all of your work and leadership around these challenging and complex issues. To all of you tuning in today, thank you. We know your time is valuable and we're deeply grateful for all you do for Wild Cornell Medicine. If you're interested in supporting the work of Wild Cornell or any of the faculty on today's panel, there will be more information in an email you'll receive from us tomorrow. My sincerest thanks to all those who have joined us for one or more of these events over the last few weeks. We're so grateful to have you as part of the Wild Cornell Medicine family. We'll see you again soon. Until then, please stay safe and well. <laughs>